I will try to give as brief an introduction as I can to my colleague Bob Weinberg, but it's hard. <laughs> Bob um, has been at MIT uh, since 1960, and uh, <laughs> <it> just, <laughs> apparently just can't wait to take over. Uh, I was going to tell you all about his PhD thesis, which, by the way, was on small nuclear RNAs. I was going to, which still are interesting, and go through a number of wonderful and really um, moving times uh, as our labs were near each other and some of the most wonderful discoveries happened next door. Bob's on. Thank you for that <laughs> kind introduction. As David implied, uh, I'm a bit of a stick in the mud. I was in this room already September of 1960. Uh, I went away for a brief period when I did a, a postdoc uh, at the Salk in the winter of 71, 72. Salvador Luria came by and he told me, he didn't ask me, he told me I would be a member of the then uh, MIT Cancer Center, about which at the time I knew nothing. Uh, he didn't really ask me, he just told me, but I, and I pretended having a modicum of pride uh, faint interest, and so I waited for two, maybe three days before I agreed to come. Uh, and it's a decision I've never regretted, but of course here I am now, 38 years later. Uh, in 72, uh, I spent quite a bit of time walking through the gutted uh, remains of what had been the Brigham Chocolate Factory, uh, and uh, <clears throat> began to see the outlines of our future uh, home, which I would occupy uh, for a decade before moving over to the Whitehead, uh, where I've been for the last quarter century. And what's been remarkable for me over the ensuing years is the fact that there have been intimate daily contacts across the, both sides of, of Main Street, which have held together a biological community which has been remarkably interactive in spite of the uh, potentially disruptive effects of living and working in different buildings. Uh, to, to my mind, this continued interaction has really been one of the glories of the MIT biology department. Nonetheless, uh, you didn't come to hear me reminisce, and uh, we've been, <clears throat> been enjoined from doing so, so I'll move ahead to discuss the science. Uh, uh, by the way, one of the aspects of, of this symposium, which I find most remarkable, is how different it is from one comparable symposium of 10 and 20 years ago, because here you've heard with ever-increasing frequency how we're in focus now for the first time on really trying to treat people a promise that was implicit uh, with uh, Richard Nixon and Ted Kennedy's war on cancer of 1971. But only now, many decades later, are we beginning to deliver on that promise, or at least attempting to do so, and I think that's most exciting. My own research in recent years has been focused on trying to understand some of the later stages of uh, human tumor pathogenesis. Here is the description of the multi-step process that leads to the formation of the primary tumor, as first enunciated by uh, Kinsler and Vogelstein uh, more than two decades ago. Uh, and this last stage of metastasis has been one which has been and is still uh, very poorly understood, uh, but it deserves great attention because metastases are ultimately responsible for 90% of cancer-associated mortality. And we don't really understand how they occur, although there are beginning to be some insights. Do additional mutations need to accrue to cancer cells in order for this last step of malignant progression to occur? Or, and can we begin to make a laundry list of those determinants which are responsible for dictating the malignant behavior of cancer cells? In fact, the actual dissemination of cancer cells and the formation of uh, metastases is itself a complex multi-step process. Here we see the multiple steps of this, which result uh, ultimately in the formation of macrometastases. Uh, I believe it was Louis Chodosh who mentioned uh, previously that this last step is actually the least efficient of these uh, steps, even though there may be hundreds to thousands of micrometastases in the bone marrow of, for example, um, uh, women diagnosed with breast cancer, only half of those who have those micrometastases will ever go on to progress to metastatic disease, a testimonial to the fact that the adaptation of cancer cells, of disseminated cancer cells, to a foreign tissue microenvironment is fortunately a very inefficient process. If one examines this invasion metastasis cascade as described first by Fiedler, 
one comes to realize that it's biologically as complex as the steps that preceded it and led previously to the formation of a primary tumor. And that begins to beg the question of how cancer cells are clever enough to acquire all of these multiple cell biological attributes and whether additional mutations are required in order to empower a cancer cell to successfully execute all the steps of the invasion metastasis cascade and to generate a macroscopic metastasis. In uh, my own laboratory, much insight has come from studying tumor xenografts, in this case, experimentally transformed human breast cancer cells. Here you see them growing in mice. Here you see the epithelial cancer cells stained for the epithelial marker cytokeratin. Outside, you see the recruited mouse stromal cells. And the green cells here along the edge are of human origin. These cells have shut down their epithelial uh, cytokeratin marker, which is in red, and instead express vimentin, which is a mesenchymal marker. And this shift in their expression of these um, the cytoskeletal markers indicates that these cells have undergone an epithelial mesenchymal transition. Uh, as I'll indicate shortly, this involves far more than simply the change in cytoskeletal protein expression. Here one can see something about the topological localization of these cells. Here's a tongue of these epithelial cancer cells surrounded once again by recruited mouse stromal cells. And if one looks carefully, one sees that the carcinoma cells on the outside of this tongue of cancer cells have shut down the epithelial marker a, a cytokeratin, and instead, over here, one sees they now express vimentin. And uh, this indicates, or it certainly strongly suggests, that these cancer cells, when they're closely opposed to the nearby mouse stroma, have undergone this EMT. Um, and, and to the extent that this is an important process in uh, dictating the future biological behavior of these cells, this begins to suggest that the microenvironment of a cancer cell um, is, in fact, an important determinant of its behavior. Uh, and this microenvironment cannot be really discerned simply by sequencing, to state the obvious, the genome of, of the cancer cell. One must also know well, the uh, cells that are dictating its, its localized environment in the tumor. In fact, the EMT, the epithelial mesenchymal transition, is a program of ancient vintage. It was developed already in the Cambrian era, and a diverse array of uh, metazoan phyla employed in various stages of embryonic morphogenesis. Here one sees uh, in, in the sea urchin the cells that have have delaminated from the uh, outer epithelium, have invaded into the blastocele, and these uh, cells are going to be the um, cells which are the unlog and the endoderm and the mesoderm. And there's a series of other such steps in embryonic morphogenesis, including here uh, the emigration of cells from the primitive chordate neural crest. These light blue cells will ultimately insinuate themselves into the uh, skin where they will form the melanocytes. And uh, I also mentioned in passing, and just by way of introduction, that the EMT is a multifocal, uh, multi-faceted program involving changes in motility and invasiveness uh, in cell, uh, surface proteins as well as intermediate uh, filament proteins, which represent, a, in many respects, a profound, almost total change in cell biological behavior. The EMT can be uh, programmed, can be choreographed by any one of a series of six to eight transcription factors, each of which can act pleiotropically in an appropriate cell type to uh, program the, uh, the, the EMT. Um, and if one ectopically expresses such a transcription factor in an epithelial cell, then often one observes the total panoply of EMT-associated phenotypic changes. Moreover, and conversely, if one takes mouse breast cancer cells, as Jing Young did here, which express high levels of one of these factors, the twist transcription factor, one sees that these uh, cells will metastasize and form multiple uh, metastatic nodules here on the surface of the lungs of a tumor-bearing mouse. But if one deprives the cancer cells of expression of twists through the artifice of an siRNA, then uh, one sees a, a virtual uh, loss of all metastases. And the few metastases that continue to form give evidence of um, continued uh, twist expression, never having been deprived of it in the first place. Experiments like this persuade one that, in this case, this embryonic transcription factor is essential for the ability of these cells to uh, disseminate. However, whether a, a transcription factor like twist can on its own convert a fully non-metastatic cell into a metastatic cell remains uh, unproven to this day. Nonetheless, knowing the uh, pleiotropic powers of such a transcription factor, one can begin to um, ask the question of how many steps of the invasion metastasis cascade could in principle be programmed by such a transcription factor. And here I make the speculation, I think it's increasingly uh, plausible, that if a, a primary cancer cell turns on the twisted transcription factor, all of these steps of the invasion metastasis cascade are within its purview, save for the last step, which involves ostensibly the adaptation of cells from one tissue to a tissue microenvironment, the strange tissue environment, which to my mind is not within the purview of such a transcription factor. 
if this kind of scheme is, is uh, further substantiated, it represents a great conceptual simplification of uh, metastasis because it indicates that by turning on one of these transcription factors, the whole processes involving the metastatic, the physical dissemination of cancer cells can be controlled and can be uh, activated. Nonetheless, the last step, the one of colonization, still represents terra incognita. We don't, really don't understand how this occurs. Um, importantly, uh, if this is all true, then in fact the act activation of this uh, transcription, of such a transcription factor, can be achieved without any genetic alterations in the cancer cell. And the work of, of uh, Vogelstein and Markowitz has demonstrated recently that in the case of colon cancer, they estimated it would take 18, or 18 years or so for a primary colon carcinoma to form. However, the metastases in the liver were already apparent within the next uh, subsequent year or two, and that's consistent with the notion that this last step of dissemination really do does not seem to depend on additional rare mu mutational events. It doesn't prove it, however. Uh, in my own laboratory, we've investigated a series of alternative uh, uh, transcription factors. Here's the work of uh, Piyush Gupta, who transformed um, human melanocytes um, using a transformation protocol that Bill Hahn had developed. He had known that a whole variety of normal human cells can be transformed by this uh, protocol, yielding tumorigenic, vigorously growing cells, which rarely or ever uh, metastasize. In contrast, putting the identical set of transforming oncogenes into normal human melanocytes, one got metastases by the hundreds in the lungs, the liver, the spleen, and the mesentery of the intestine. And this tells us a couple interesting lessons, one of which is that the cell of origin uh, in, in which transformation takes place prior to any kind of acquisition of somatic mutations or experimentally introduced mutations, the cell of an or origin is an important determinant of the eventual metastatic behavior of the cancer cell. Uh, in the case of the uh, melanocytes, as I mentioned before, they derive from the primitive neural crest. They employ the slug transcription factor, which can induce an EMT. And indeed, if one looks at uh, experimentally transformed melanocytes, they express a thousand-fold higher levels of this transcription factor than do breast cancer cells once again indicative that the normal differentiation program is an important determinant of behavior subsequent to um, transformation. Gupta's work showed that by shutting down slug, uh, in this case, 93%, uh, he got a 93% um, reduction in, in metastases if the uh, transformed melanocytes were deprived of this transcription factor. And this represents a nice vignette where the early uh, embryonic program that allowed the ancestors of these melanocytes to uh, disseminate throughout the normal embryo uh, is employed and resurrected by the melanocytes if they undergo transformation in the adult. Uh, in fact, there are a whole series of these transcription factors, and the work of Sendo Raimani has begun to generate interactomes in which these different transcription factors interact in different ways. Uh, it's complex, but it seems increasingly likely that they work in different groups in different kinds of human carcinomas. It's plausible now, but hardly proven, that uh, there are several of these transcription factors that are active in virtually all human carcinomas, but we're far from being able to prove that uh, experimentally.